I'm now trying to tell you something about my research, which is maybe not always so easy uh, when you are doing pure mathematics. Uh, in the inst instructions for this talk, it said that you could think of uh, what you would say to your family or friends when they ask what you do. But I usually say, you don't really want to know. But now I, I try to say something. So my main research interests have been a combination of uh, analysis in metric spaces. I mean, the general topic is mathematical analysis. But what I've been focused on is analysis, something called analysis in metric spaces, and then the study of uh, certain nonlinear partial differential equations, or the combination of these two things. So to study PDEs in these uh, uh, nonlinear spaces. I guess uh, partial difference equations are probably familiar to quite many of you if you are from the engineering schools. So I would say almost everything is in, in like physics and engineering sciences and other, other natural sciences is modeled with uh, some kind of partial differential equations. But uh, what is a pure mathematician doing when they study PDEs? So we want to establish somehow solid foundations to the theory. We want to define exactly like uh, how, what we mean by a solution. So for example, what kind of function space it has to be in. So if you think of some PDE that you maybe even met in your bachelor studies, even if you are not a mathematician, then the usual definition is like a point-wise definition. You have to have function and it has some uh, derivative which describes how it's changing and then you have some equation condition which uh, somehow requires it to satisfy this uh, equation in every point. But in, in, in the real life case, uh, it happens very often that actually your uh, solution is not nice everywhere. So in some points, it's not kind of point-wisely defined. So you have to find uh, different ways to, uh, to define your problem exactly if you want to be able to say that there exists exactly one solution. So you both have to know, want to know that there is a solution and also that there are not more than one solution. And uh, once you have your uh, problem with a unique solution, then you, the next step that is also very important for applications is to study some stability uh, properties. Because in the real world, you never have anything that is exactly as you can describe it with the equations. So if uh, changing a little bit the initial values of your system or or the shape of your system, then you could get a totally different solutions that, that would not be good for applications. So a pure mathematician could also study that kind of, of things. But then from PDEs to these metric spaces that might not have a linear structure. So what it is and why I'm interested in it. So many things appear in, for example, two-dimensional di plane or three-dimensional object or system, or maybe you study something that depends on 10,000 parameters and you model it in a 10,000-dimensional uh, linear space. Uh, but then you can also find the simple examples. Uh, for example, you take a surface. So it's kind of two-dimensional object, but it's not any more linear. Maybe when you zoom in, then it behaves like a linear thing, and you can do almost the same thing as, uh, as in the uh, this, uh, Euclidean space, but, uh, but, but then there are also much more complicated geometries, and I try to later give you some example about uh, what other phenomena can occur. So my research has kind of two kinds of goals. So one goal is to 
develop methods that would work in as a general possible setting. So that when, like, uh, for example, in some applications, you have certain space that is not the linear space, then you could apply these general methods so that everyone doesn't need to start from the scratch if they model their system uh, in this nonlinear space with some PDE. So to develop, for example, some PDE tools that are very flexible. But the other goal is that this, I think it's pretty important to me, is also that when you study problems in this very general setting, then you have very little structure. So you really have to think like, uh, what is crucial? Why these phenomena occur? So it also somehow it forces us to find a better understanding of these phenomena that have been studied previously in, in, in the settings with more structure. And sometimes it, that way we also might improve the classical results by understanding these things better. But maybe, so what is a metric space? So in Finnish, metric space is metrin and avarus. So maybe the first thought is, uh, is the space, and the mathematician thinks that the diameter is one meter. But uh, this is not exactly my metric space. So for a mathematician, a space is just a collection of points. Usually there are infinite number of points. So, but now I just draw there a couple of them, and I gave names to two of them. So I have X and Y. They are just names for some points. But if you want to analyze a set of points, you need some more structure. So quite often the next step is to uh, study just systems that have some metric. Uh, so um, term metric means essentially the, the same thing as distance. So you take any two points from your space and you know their distance. And that should satisfy the same conditions as distance usually satisfy. Like if you want to go from uh, Dipoli to Otakari 1, uh, it's better to just go from here to there than to stop by in Fat Lizard. You, the distance is bigger if you go to, you cannot save time by going through Fat Lizard. But in some cases, you might not lose anything. But uh, one good, perfectly good metric would be that the distance of any two points is one. So if you just think, I, if I have to go anywhere, it's, it doesn't matter if I have to go to Otakari 1 or to US. So that's kind of boring metric, and it doesn't tell anything about your space. You cannot do anything, any analysis with that discrete metric. So for my analysis, uh, we need some extra conditions. So we cannot study all metric spaces. We have to restrict somehow. So the first condition that we usually impose is uh, that the space is doubling. Uh, so what does a doubling space mean? So now that we have a metric, we can talk about balls. So a ball is the set of all points whose distance to some given point is less than the radius of the ball. So a ball comes with a center and radius. And it's just a set of points. It might not look like a ball if your metric is weird. So now we have balls. And what is doubling? Doubling means that if we have this one ball, and then we would like to cover it with smaller balls, of radius one half of the original radius, we can do it with some bounded number of balls. So let's say that uh, your doubling constant is 10, so you need at most 10 ba smaller balls to cover your original ball. So with that, you can actually already do quite a lot, but if you want to study your PDEs, then you need something more. Because there are some spaces that look very nice, kind of, almost like linear and very simple structure, and also pretty connected, but uh, all, function, all continuous functions, for example, have derivative zero. Yeah, 
So if you want to study PDEs, then we need something else. And usually mathematicians do that by assuming that the space satisfies some Poincaré inequality, for example. So it is a simple formula that I'm not going to show you that somehow tells you that uh, the derivative of the function controls how much the function can oscillate. And that's somehow the starting point. I mean, if your derivative doesn't control your function, then you cannot do anything with it, anything meaningful with the derivative. But from the Poincaré inequality, it's not very easy to see what kind of spaces satisfy it. And it's all also not very easy to test whether if you are given a space, does it satisfy Poincaré inequality? So maybe something a little bit more concrete. So some of my research projects have uh, uh, considered like how to, so there is a curve family characterization of Poincaré inequality. Um, so in practice, Poincaré inequality means that if you took, take any two points from your space, then there is kind of family of curves that spreads out nicely uh, and that uh, they are all pretty short, so their length is comparable to the distance of the points. But what are these nice spaces without a Poincaré inequality? We could, for example, think about uh, this snowflake curve. So we are interested in the boundary of this last picture. So how do you construct this? You start with a triangle, then you replace the middle third of each side by two uh, lines of equal length. And then you continue that with each piece of a boundary infinitely many times. So in the end, you have something. Occur so now we are not thinking of the blue area, just the boundary. So you end up with something that has not finite length. And actually, you take any two points from there, and their distance is uh, infinite if you have to follow the boundary. So in this kind of space, you don't have, a, you cannot do anything with the classical derivative. Uh, but actually what we did recently is that, uh, so you can define some uh, like uh, fractional partial differential equations that are non-local on, on this kind of set, like uh, this fractal type set, for example. And, and there are some methods that you can, but like, for example, in this case, this uh, do blue domain is very nice at least locally. I mean, it has ugly boundary, but inside it's, uh, it's uh, just a part of a plane. So there are some methods that you can get information about uh, these non-local uh, fractional PDEs on the boundary of the set by studying some other PDEs inside the domain. And then you can do it so that also the inside is some general space, not just a domain in Rn. Uh, then one more example about demonstrating what can happen in, in metric spaces. So let's go to the parking uh, area of uh, uh, Blanc. And suppose that we have a car there, and, but we have to move it to another slot for some weird reason. So if we want to move it there, it's kind of easy. We just drive there almost directly. But if we need to move it to the one next to the first one, it's not so easy because we cannot turn the wheels 90 degrees to drive uh, directly. So if we have car here, then we would probably have to go like this or go here and back. So the real distance is much longer in this case than this uh, blue arrow. So that kind of things appear, for example, in some group structures. So you could have like a subset of your three-dimensional space, and then you have just two directions where you can move. But then these two directions are changing in every point so that by uh, like Going to certain routes, you can anyway reach any point from your three-dimensional space, 
even though you always have just two directions where you are out, allowed to move. So, for example, these kind of spaces are covered uh, by analysis in metric spaces. Well, I, I have never really studied the parking area <laughs> space, but anyway. So that was essentially the last thing I really wanted to say. I just wanted to finish my talk with this beautiful view from our campus that I really enjoy coming to my work and through this area. Even though I'm a little bit saddened that this tree uh, we lost it in the last storm, and it's not anymore there next fall. Thank you.